Rededication the other way. And rededications, uh, I think it was a hundred. I come way on down with it. it. Sounds like you're going the other way instead of the down way. You got to go to the down low. Y'all like that right there, didn't you? The down low. But I think there was 180-something people that gave their life to the Lord or rededicated their life to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think they had over 300 last night attend. Praise God. Praise God. I think uh, last week they said that uh, last weekend was a, a record attendance for any time they've ever done Trail to Hell. As many people that were coming through. So praise God for that as well. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God's good. He's very good to us, isn't he? Amen. Amen. Well, as you can tell, my voice is still, it still ain't where it needs to be, but it's going to get there. Amen. 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 So just in, in the battle right now, sometimes we get in the battle. That's what you're going to do in the middle of the battle. Amen. You're going to fight through it or you're going to give up in the middle. Well, I'm a warrior for the Lord. Amen. And I'm fighting through that thing. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to read in Matthew this morning, chapter 4, if you would stand for the reading of the Word for just a moment. Hallelujah. And last week, uh, last Sunday, I talked about you matter. And uh, I felt like I was going to go a different direction today. But God just kept me right here in this thing for a minute. And so I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit. But I believe you'll be able to follow me. Today I'm going to talk about how people matter. Those that, that are not you, not yourself. The other people matter. And not only the other people matter, but also that we matter to him. You know, last week I talked about how you matter to the church and, and, and so forth. But, but we matter to God. And, and I want to read a couple of verses here. And, and, and like I say, we'll jump around a little bit. Just stay with me. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 22 is where we're going to be at this morning to start with. Praise the Lord. So then Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Now in the King James Bible, it says straightway they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and the boat was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and they followed him. Wonderful Master, I thank you for your word today, God. I thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit and the presence that's in this house. I thank you, Father, for the gifts of the Spirit this morning. I thank you, Father, that, that you are speaking to your people today, God. And Lord, no matter how many words I say, God, it will never take the place of what you can say in just a matter of seconds. Father, I pray that the words you have given me, God, would just line up with what you just spoke. Father, that we would see that we need you now more than ever. That, God, you care about us more than ever, Lord. Father, that you're just not sitting up there picking and choosing, oh, God. But, Lord, you love all of us, God. We matter to you, Lord. And, Father, I thank you, God, that you took just a brief moment to speak to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, I ask you today to anoint my lips to preach and teach your word. Anoint the ears to hear it and the hearts to receive it, God. I pray this morning, Father, for strength where strength is needed in those that are weary this morning, God. I pray for healing where healing is needed for those that are sick this morning, God. I pray for wisdom and knowledge this morning, God. And may your word go forth this morning with the boldness and the authority of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, do what you need to do today. Allow me to be a vessel for you, God. The Lord, may everything that takes place in this house bring you honor and bring you glory. Father, for each one of those individuals that have been given their life to you over the past couple of weekends, each one of those individuals that have rededicated their life to you, I pray today, God, that it was sincere and from the heart. And Lord, this morning, they are finding a place to worship you at today, God. I pray that truly life change happened for you. Now, Father, we count it done this morning. 
And it's an honor and a privilege to be here. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One more hand clap for the Lord. Hallelujah. Turn around and tell somebody you love them today. Hallelujah. 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 Well, today I want to talk about individuals that we meet every day. People that we meet every day and people that we come across every day. We come across people, don't we? We come across people. I told you last week there's over 7 billion people in the world today or in the earth on the earth today and and these are people that are next door to us these are people that we work with people we work for people that work up under us maybe maybe the people that we see in the grocery store at the gas station or at walmart or or wherever it may be we bump into people everywhere we go you can't go somewhere without bumping into somebody do you know how many people probably pass this church every day i was hoping somebody might have a number on that but uh but I don't know either, but if I had to guess, it would be in the hundreds. Because just this morning on my way to church, I probably passed 50 cars. So I imagine it would be in the hundreds. And I would imagine that the people that pass by this church are people that we run into every day in Forsyth. Every day in Forsyth. And sometimes we run into them in other places. Everywhere we go, we're always bumping into somewhere. And no matter where you go on, on this planet, you're going to bump into somebody. And it's weird how sometimes you bump into somebody you know, isn't it? You know, I remember me and Jennifer, we used to, we'd go somewhere and vacation or something and wouldn't think nobody would be around. And all of a sudden, bam, out of nowhere, hey, Pastor Darrell. What the world, man? Just out of the blue, out of nowhere, you somewhere and people recognize you. It's weird how that happens it's everywhere you go. But you and I are part of the, a human race. And as hard as it might try to be for you to try to be the only person around, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. There's always going to be somebody. Did you know in America there's a person born every eight seconds? And a person dies every 10 seconds. And every 29 seconds, somebody uh, immigrates over or migrates into the, work, uh, into the United States. So if you look at that, that's one additional person every 17 seconds that comes into America. One person every 17 seconds. In America right now, the United States is over 320 million people are right here in the United States. Now, that seems like a big number, and it is a big number. But when you look at places like China and India, they, they run into billions. Over 1 billion people live there. People are everywhere. And just about every piece of land on planet Earth has people there. Just about every, every one of them. And we are commanded... By the Great Commission in Matthew chapter, what is it, chapter 28, 19, and 20, I believe it is. It says, go ye therefore into all nations. Is that what it says? He's talking to us, beloved. We are to go and disciple them. And we are to go and show them love. Everywhere. And Jesus was a great example of this because we just read where he goes and he's just walking along. And we, we see Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And, and we know they're just they're fishermen, right? They're fishermen. Their fathers were fishermen. Their grandfathers were probably fishermen. And back in that day and time, you kind of inherited what your, uh, what your father done or what your dad done. Or maybe if you was a woman, what your mom done. You did that w with your life uh, because that's just how it was. You was defined by who your family was. And so I want to look at these four guys for just a minute because they, they loved to fish probably. They loved fishing. Just like me, I loved fishing. See, I'd have been good back then in that day because I loved to fish. And, and most of the time, they, they loved waking up probably before uh, daylight just to go fishing. When I go fishing, my wife tell you, I can't hardly sleep the night before. I just love to go fishing. Maybe they enjoyed having to compete with others. Uh, to try to get to the best fishing place on the lake there, on the sea there. But, but maybe they enjoyed having to, to uh, untangle their lines and they're uh, mending their nets all the time. And, and maybe they enjoyed cleaning fish. Now, I hate that part. I like people to bring me clean fish. Maybe they like the smell of fish. I don't know. Maybe their wives enjoyed them smelling like fish. I don't know. My wife don't like me smelling like fish. Maybe they just liked it on their hands and on their clothes. And I don't know. Maybe they just enjoyed the the minimal amount of money that they made by fishing. I don't know what it was, but, but something held them to fishing. 
And how many of you, I want to ask you this question, how many of you, don't show me your hands, but how many of you absolutely love your job? How many of you love your job? You know that a poll said that 70% of Americans are disengaged from their jobs. You know how many people work in America? 100 million people. Out of 300 million, 100 million people hold jobs in America. The survey said that 30% of the people like their job. 70% of people don't like their job. And 20% of those absolutely hate their job. Now, I believe that Peter and Andrew and and James and John were either in the 70 percentile of those that didn't like their job or maybe even in the 20% who actually hated their job. Now, why do I say that? Because it didn't take a whole lot of convincing from Jesus to get them just to drop their nets, to walk away from the family business, even leave their fathers behind. And the job that they've been doing all their life, they just walked away. Jesus just come by and say, hey, follow me. They said, let's go. <laughs> Bob says straight away that they left. Straight away. These guys couldn't wait to get off the boat. They didn't bat an eye at it. They didn't say goodbye. They didn't put in a two-week notice. Straightway means they just left. And here's why I believe they were so willing to drop the family business, if you would have to say, and leave their fathers. They understood and realized a better opportunity when they saw it. And they weren't going to let anything stand in the way of that opportunity and that blessing. They realized that their life had a higher purpose than just out there catching a few fish and mending some nets. Jesus told, I'm going to make you fishers of men, not sneaky old fish anymore. I'm going to cause your life to have meaning from this day forth. There's no more slime, no more fish guts, no more scales, no more broken nets, no more steam, uh, uh, storms, no more late nights. I'm, I'm elevating you. Your life is about to change. Everything they said you would be is about to be erased in your past. It no longer is going to be a determining factor of your future anymore. Who you were before is not who you're going to be now. It doesn't matter who your daddy was, who your mama was, or still is today. It doesn't matter what the prearrangements have been made for you. It doesn't matter if we could just look past the stink and the slime, the junk that predetermined who you would be. It no longer has an effect on you because now you walk with me. Oh, you'll catch it in a minute. See, I ain't talking about jobs here. I'm talking about lives. I'm talking about lives here. It's really something and and unusual how people can get used to things and get comfortable things for no reason at all. You ever heard anybody say, well, I'm this way because I grew up this way. Oh, I do this because my daddy did it or my mama did it. I act this way because that's how my family, oh, it's a generational thing. Well, let me give you a little gold nugget this morning. Break the generational curse this morning and rise up and be a child of God in Jesus Christ and say, I will no longer be that way. I'm set free. I'm set free. If y'all want to throw something this way, it's okay. No, I'm just kidding. But Jesus told four young men, he said, I'm going to elevate your status. As of this moment, I'm going to lose your, use your life to do something that no one in this world has ever imagined that you would be able to do. You were just poor old fishermen, kids. One moment. People said you would never accomplish anything. All you were good for was mending the broken net, cleaning fish. But I'm going to use you to raise up a church that will change the world forever. You're about to make more of a difference in this world and the future generation than any man or woman has in history. People are going to be talking about you. People are going to be listening to you. People are going to be reading your writings thousands of years down the road because you matter to me and you matter to this world. And I believe if you can get your word out there that I'm putting inside of you, you will let people know that they matter to me. And call them just by simply saying, follow me. Jesus is calling us this morning with them simple words. Follow me. Follow me. Stop doing what you're doing and follow me. Quit worrying about this like the word said, the things of the world. Carrying these things. Lay down the nets. That's the things of the world. Lay it down. Put down the fish, the burdens. Put down these things. Set aside who you were in your past and pick up right now with me. 
It doesn't matter even what happened 20 minutes ago. It's in your past right now. What matters is where you are right now with Christ Jesus. And I hope where you are is to be a follower. Your past is no longer your present. Or it wouldn't be called your past. You thought you were going to be tied up in all that stuff. stuff. You thought there was no escape in it. You thought it would define who were you going to be. But Jesus said, I got new identity for you. I got new identity. Who in here has got new identity this morning? Hallelujah. So you're about to go through a spiritual transformation today. And that's what he's telling. In fact, he says, Simon, I'm even going to change your name. From now on, they're fixing to call you Peter the Rock. Dwayne Johnson ain't got nothing on Peter the Rock, does he? Oh, no, no, no. See, a rock doesn't have much meaning when you're a fisherman. But it has a whole lot of meaning when you're going to be the cornerstone in the church. It means a whole lot if you're going to be involved in ministry. It means a whole lot if you want God to use your life. And give you some focus and direction. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In the New Living Translation, it says it like this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. And a new life has begun. He has planned for our lives. He had a plan for my life when I said, Lord, I need you in my life in July of 2002. He said, I got a plan for you. And now you've come over to me. And now I can use you. I have a purpose. I have a higher calling for you. Amen. John 13, 34 and 35 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also Love one another. By this shall all men know that they are my disciples. If you have love one to another. God is calling his people to a higher standard. To a higher standard. Look, if I said the Ten Commandments in here, most of us would know what I'm talking about, right? Amen. Who won't stand up and recite them for me? I'm just kidding. Would you do that? No, I'm just kidding. But the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. It's just relating to God, right? The second one says, you shall not make idols. There again, we're talking about God. The third one says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We're talking about God. Number four says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Once again, we're talking about God. Then it says, honor your father and your mother. Now we're starting to talk about others. You shall not murder. Who's that? Others. You should not commit adultery. Who's that? Others. You should not steal. What's that? Others. You should not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's others. You should not covet. That's others. The first four commandments have to do with a relationship with God. But the next six commandments have to do with others. Others outside this church. Others in this church. It has to do with that. It's hard to lie about somebody. It's hard to steal from somebody. It's hard to murder and it's hard to covet them if you love them. See, if you love somebody, you can't sit there and put your mouth on them. Uh, If you love somebody, you can't sit there and gossip about them. Oh, come on. This is why Jesus told us to love our neighbor as ourself. I'm not fixing to steal from myself. I sure ain't fixing to kill myself. Love your neighbor as yourself. So you won't have any problem with those six commandments of the ten if you love others. And you value them enough to say they matter. Understand something. People are not just intimate objects out here. They're not disposable. We may think that sometimes because there's so many people that it doesn't matter if one dies. Oh, that's a soul. It's either going to heaven or it's going to hell. We should be caring about which way it's going. But understand something this morning. Every single person matters. Whether we notice them or not, whether we care about them or not, or whether we want him to care about them or not, they still matter. Psalm 24 one says, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwelleth in it. They belong to and they matter to God. Can you imagine the conversation before God sent his son to be born in a manger? You ever thought about that? The conversation that was going on in heaven? I don't know if it was a conversation, but sometimes I like to just think about things like that. Could you imagine the angels talking to God and saying, God, why are you going to send your only son? To go down and be born of flesh and, and to be wrapped in a, a swaddling's clothes and be put into a manger. Don't you know they're going to reject them, God? 
Oh, God, don't you know that they're going to despise them? Don't you know they're going to beat them? Don't you know they're going to they spit on them? Don't you know they're going to kill them? I believe God said, yeah, I'm going to send them anyway. But why, God? Because they all matter to me. They all matter to you. So you didn't ever think of it like that, did you? What if God said, you send your son out to die for them all? That's what he did, though, because you matter, and they matter. One day, Jesus and his disciples, here they are, they're just walking along. He says, hey, i got to go to Samaria. I don't, hold on, hold on, no, no, no. We don't go through Samaria, Jesus. Oh, huh. yeah, those people over there, they ain't Jew. We don't go through Samaria. They don't worship the way we worship. No Jew ever goes to Samaria. Matter of fact, we walk miles around it just to bypass it. So why are we going, Jesus? Six of my matters over there. Somebody matters over there. There's a little woman there with a lot of stuff going on, and she matters to you. Some of us have written people off, but understand something this morning. God has not written them off. Amen. People may irritate you. Oh, yeah, you can give God a hand clap for that right there. People may get on your nerves. People may be hurting you, and you probably even despise them. But as Christians... You've got to understand something. See, Jesus fed his Judas. The one who was about to sell him out. The one who was going to introduce a new killing frenzy amongst Christians. Jesus sat next to him at the Last Supper. Judas was not someone Jesus pushed aside. If there was anybody that could ever been pushed aside, it could have been Judas. But Judas was someone who Jesus said, you come sit right next to me. I believe even though he knew his heart, I believe he was hoping that something might change at that last moment. Because he mattered. He mattered the whole way. So my question to you this morning is, are you mature enough to sit with and feed your Judas? He matters to Jesus. Does anybody understand what I'm saying this morning? Who gets to decide who matters? Me? You? Society? Revelation 21, 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hears say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. The Spirit of God is calling all people to come. All people to come. What are we saying to him? What are we doing that is in agreement with the Spirit and what the Spirit is saying to the people? Matthew 18 and 18 uh, New Living Translation says, I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Do we actually realize the power of our prayers this morning, beloved? I'm not sure that we understand all that God wants to do with us and with our witness. I wonder how many of us claim the soul for the kingdom of God even this morning. How many of you woke up this morning and said, God, bring one person in that church this morning and win them over for you. How many people invited somebody today? King James tells us to bind it on earth, and it will be bound in heaven. To bind something, you got to understand, you got to claim something. You have to want it. You have to go to work for it. You have to make it happen. You can't ignore them anymore. You can't walk past them anymore. You can't turn away from them anymore. You've got to start praying for them from this day forward. Why? Because you've got to start loving them. Where and who are they going to come to when they're in need? The church. They come to the church when they're in need. And if we don't receive and love them, who's going to? I don't know how many of you are familiar with the author, James Maxwell, but he said that 90%, the first question a person that comes into a church and asks of a leader is not, are you competent to lead me? But is are you going to help, or not is are you going to help me? But the first word they ask when they look at a leader and decide to follow is, do you care for me? Do you care for me? The reason that people want to know that they care because they want they don't want to submit to somebody that's gonna backstab and hurt them. They only want to follow somebody that they can trust and care for them. And we can't introduce them to Jesus unless we have a relationship with them. 
That's why it's so important that we welcome people with open arms, not just when they come in here, but when we see them on the street. When we see them on the street. How is it that we think that God was able to forgive us? And some of us in all our wickedness and all our, our smud and smut and everything else, but he's not able to forgive those around us. How crazy is it that we think that, that he can forgive us for everything in our past and he can do so much in our life now, but he can't do it for nobody else? That his hands are somewhat tied. I don't know about you, but, but I got some stuff in my life that I needed God to forgive me for. And you know what? I still have stuff that I need God to forgive me for. I got some stuff that I ain't proud of in my past. And, and I got some things that if it wasn't but for grace, there was no chance in this world that I would be here today. There's no way that I would make it to heaven. There was no way. Because why? I needed his grace. And if he can extend his grace and forgiveness towards me, why can't I extend it towards somebody else? How is it that we sometimes uh, depend on, on all of that but think that it's not available for nobody else? We think that, he's the, that we're the only one that he died for. That we're the only one that he walked up Calvary's hill for. That we're the only one that he, he took the nails for. That he, we're the only one that he, he put stripes upon his back for. Well, we've got to remember John 3, 16. It said, God so loved the world. The world. The world, not just for sight, not just your hometown, the world. They matter to him and they matter to us today. We can't call ourselves Christians and not be concerned about the same thing that Christ is concerned about. Not just what he was concerned about then, but what the Father's concerned about now. And we can't call ourselves Christians and not can be concerned about people all over this world. We've got to have that mind. I'm not saying we're all going to pack up and be missionaries. We've got mission fields right here. Just drive around some streets. There's missions fields right here. 1 Timothy 2, 4 said, Who will have all men to be saved? And to come into the knowledge of the truth. It's not just about me and you anymore. No. It's not just about us. We need to get stirred up in our hearts about them. Those outside because they matter. Pastor, you sure are preaching a lot on outside because we got to be a church that's evangelistic. We got to be a church that reaches out. We got to be a church that says, no, we're not going to wait for them to walk in. We're going to reach out to them. We've got to get a mindset to go outside. They matter to God and they got to matter to us. We're not defined any longer by our circumstances, and neither are they. Everyone deserves the second chance. And some of us deserve a hundred chances. We're not divine by our past anymore. In spite of what our past may be telling us. In spite of some of your people in your past might be telling you. In spite of where you've been. In spite of what you might have looked like then. And even what some people look like today. It don't matter about education or lack of education. It doesn't matter if we're a doctor or a businessman. Or even a little old fisherman who's out all night long trying to make a living. God has a higher purpose for your life and what you are doing. And where you are at right now than you realize. He has it, beloved. Yeah. It's up to you to fulfill it. Yeah. You must fulfill it. Right. If we're to reach this world, and that's what we're doing, y'all. I know it, it, you hear me, it's going to be redundant for this whole month. Is that the right word? Redundant? Repetitive? But that's why we're doing what we're doing up there. That's why it's long hours. That's why it's hard. That's why people are tired. That's why people's voices ain't here. But look, I lose my voice every week to see a hundred people give their life to the Lord. Every week. Every week. I don't know about you, but I ain't never been a part of something in a church where in two weekends over 400 people have given their life to the Lord. As Pastor Jeremiah said the other day, he said, Maybe some churches have been around 50 years and haven't seen a hundred people come to the Lord. But love it, this is something powerful. That is happening. And I need you to just continue to pray for us. Look, not only that, you got to realize there are people coming from all over this state that are experiencing this. And why I'm on this, I believe, because I believe God's fixing to send them in. 
There are people from Monroe County that are going up there to this. When they come back, if they're, ser if they're serious about God, they're going to look for a place. Somebody's going to send them this way, and it's going to be the Holy Spirit. And we got to be willing to receive them just as they are. Because remember, some of them that are walking in, if you could look into a mirror, you'd say, it looks just like me back in the day. And we got to be able to say, just as God cleaned me up, God can clean them up. But it's up to us to be in the right mindset. Come on up, Molly, please. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which has given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Long before you showed up on this planet, Jesus had a plan for you. Long before you ever made a decision to follow him, he already had his eyes on you, saying, I hope they make that decision. I hope they follow that path. Long before you ever gave your heart to him, his grace was at work to bring salvation and a new life unto you. Amen. Why? Because he cared for you and you matter to him. You might be miserable right now in your life, but understand something. On the other side of misery, God has a hope for you. You might not like the situation you're in. You might not like the stuff you're going through, but just remember his eyes on you. You could feel worthless, but he has a purpose for you. And not only a purpose, but a high calling. If you feel insignificant, it's time to flip that coin. If you feel meaningless, start remembering you got a purpose. You're somebody. You're somebody in the Lord's army. Remember what 1 Peter 2, 9 says. The New Living Translation says, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. And somebody just point to yourself. You are chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You can't help but like that right there when he says God's very own possession. When we can submit unto the Father and say, God, I am yours and all that I have. Do what you want to with me, Lord. Do what you want to, Lord, because you chose me. And look right here. He said, this is the calling now that's on your life. Here's the purpose. So, so you can show others the goodness of God. That's what the Word says. It's not what I said. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Share your testimony with somebody. I challenge you to share it with somebody. Why should we do it? Because he called us out of a dark place in our life and into his light. And though sometimes we may not feel like it, you're blessed. Oh, no, it may not look like it sometimes. You're blessed. You've been blessed with the gift of salvation. You've been blessed with maybe the Holy Spirit. What more can we do? That's what people say. Today. What more can I do? What less could you do? What less could you do? But to tell others about his goodness, about his mercy, about his grace. There's nothing more powerful than your testimony. You're a special people. And your life can make a difference in others. You're born with a purpose. I'm asking you to fulfill that purpose. I come in this morning while I was up here rehearsing. And you didn't see it during, during uh, service because some of them are, are in rehearsal stage. But I think there's about 10 people up here this morning. I mean, I just, just look. I said, God, look at what you're doing. People have a purpose. You have a calling. It's serving. It's doing some things. I went back into my office and I just started praying. I said, God, we need a bigger stage. We need a bigger stage, Lord. And I said, ain't nobody can give it to us but you. Nobody but you, Lord. And I said, Father, as we start to reach these people, this is what he was putting in my spirit. I said, we're reaching these people up there. He said, just get ready. Just get ready. And that's what this is about. We've got to be ready at all times, not just in the month of October. But we've got to be ready at all times to receive people just as they are. Because I don't know about you, 
But when a group of people received me, I might have been all cleaned up on the outside, but I was a filthy mess on the inside. And thank God for a pastor that looked at me every day and he could see inside of me. And he said, you doing okay today? I lied to that man every Sunday. I said, I'm doing good. And I just hold back tears because he could see inside how filthy I was and how much a wreck I was, but he cared about me. After about four weeks, I finally I said, I can't do it anymore, God. I can't do it anymore. I had to give my life over to him. I walked out of the church that day, and he said, you doing all right today? I said, man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. He received me just as I was. Beloved, that's how we got to be. Stand to your feet, please. I know this is somewhat just of a simple message. But if you'll listen to the words of it, there's depth in it. There's depth in it. Because a lot of us feel just as, hey, we gave our life to the Lord and everything's good now. And it is good. It's good for you. But don't you want others to experience the blessings? Don't you want others to have what you have? Don't you want to be able to go to heaven one day and you run into somebody and you say, hey, oh, oh, hey, hey, Don, how you doing, man? He goes, man, I appreciate you telling me about the Lord that day. Wouldn't that be nice? Or do you walk by somebody and say, hey, Don, ran into you in the grocery store one day. And he goes, yeah, but it wasn't you that, that told me about the Lord. It was Terry. How's that going to make you feel? I want to be one of them every time I run into now. When I go to heaven, we know their names. I can say, I shared the love of Christ with you. I shared the love of Christ with you. Bow your heads with me for a moment. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. Lord, sometimes it's the simple things in life that make us look at our life so much. Reflect on where we've been and what we've been through. and Reflect on the goodness of who you are. Lord, I believe you're getting ready to bring in a, a harvest into this house. And Lord, I know that it's going to take the love of the Father to keep people, to get them grounded. I pray, Father, that we'd be a church that is Christ-like in all ways. We'd have the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ. We'd have the lips to speak the things of God. Father, we'd even have ears to shut out those things that we don't need to hear right now. God, you loved us so much that you gave your, your only son for us. Father, how could we not give a few words for you? How could we not give a hug for you? How could we not reach out for you? I thank you this morning, God, for what you're doing. And I'm ready, God. I'm ready to see the harvest. I'm ready to see these walls explode. I'm ready, God. I pray, Lord, that we would always be in the will of the Father, not in the will of man. Today, if you're here this morning, I don't know, I just feel like it's an eye-opener for some. God's already had all to call during worship this morning. But this morning as we worship in, in a song, if you want to come down, it's fine, but it, right there where you're at, ask God to put a new heart inside of you. Take the heart of stone. That's what his word says in Ezekiel. Take the heart of stone. Give me a new heart today, Lord, that I may see with the eyes of Christ. I Father, I give you praise today. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's lead us in something, Molly. I want a heart like yours. A heart like yours. Surrendered and set upon. Devoted to you, Lord. Like yours, 
A heart like yours, fully committed and already spoken for. I want a heart like yours, a heart like yours, surrendered and set apart. Devoted to you, Lord, I want a heart like yours, a heart like yours, fully committed and already spoken for. I don't want to be your cry this morning right there. I don't want to be your cry. I want a heart like yours. yours surrendered and set apart devoted to you Lord I want a heart like yours a heart like yours fully committed and already spoken for spoken for. Raise your hand this morning for the blessing of the Lord. Father, bless your people, Lord. I call them blessed this day. I ask you to lift your countenance upon them. Let your face shine on them. I call them blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Blessed when they come and when they go. I ask you to bless their homes, their health, their wealth their children, their families, their jobs, their businesses, their finances. Father, everything that they put their hands to, let it prosper just as their soul would prosper. Father, those things would be held back right now, God. I I ask you to release them in the name of Jesus. Father, truly we are a royal priesthood. A chosen generation. And truly, God, we are blessed this day. As the enemy would try to come in, it's still mm, to wipe out the things that have been spoken like the flood. I ask you to lift a standard against it in the name of Jesus. Father, I call your people blessed today. We give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One more hand clap of praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. Beloved, if you need prayer for anything this morning, if you'll come down, we'll pray for you. If not, I want to say God bless you to you. Have a good week. We'll see you back here Wednesday night. Amen. Amen. Amen.